Welcome everybody, we're so glad you're here with us today. Good morning, I heard somebody say not good morning. Good morning, maybe turn to the person next to you tell them good morning. That was terrible. Turn to the person next to you and maybe tell them good morning real quick. That, that was better reason. I saw people's heads turn that time. Let's all stand together. Start by singing a song that we all know real well, I'm sure. Live before in this day. Sing out. Uh, we would appreciate you 
letting us know. We've had a lot of those turned in uh, already, but we don't want to overlook anyone. And so if you know of someone that is graduating high school, eighth grade, or college this year, uh, please give us that information uh, so that we can acknowledge them on our graduation recognition service on May the 16th. Um, also, um, we are going to be hosting, uh, this is a little ways out, but we want to let you know that we are going to be hosting a combined uh, wedding and baby shower. Uh, the wedding shower will be for Casey Doss and Dwight Hedden, uh, and then the baby shower will be for Lakin and Andrew Cobb. That's going to be coming up on June the 13th uh, here at the church, and so please be advised of those things. Uh, as well. And then one last thing that I want to make mention as far as updates, uh, we uh, are presently, a number of months ago, the church uh, voted to do some upgrades on uh, the facility and on some of our very ministries. Uh, and so some of those uh, have actually already started to take place. You may never see them. You may never know it. Uh, but uh, all of the church facility uh, will be uh, LED, uh, we're hoping, after next week. Uh, a lot of the work has already begun, and there's a lot of the uh, facility uh, that has already been transferred over uh, to LED lighting. And then uh, this coming week, uh, we're going to uh, be starting here in the multi-purpose building. Uh, and transferring the lights in here and repairing, uh, whether you know it or not, there's a lot of lights in here that don't even work, that are out. Uh, we've, we've not had an opportunity to come in and, and do that, but we've got a lift that's coming in. Uh, if any of you guys are, are real uh, agile and, and like to climb high places, uh, then maybe you show up this week and we'll put you to work. No, we've got, uh, we've got someone uh, that is taking care of those things for us, and, uh, and then we, some of our trustees are going to be doing some of the other work. Uh, so anyway, some of those things are going to be taking place. So here's what we need. Uh, since we are going to be working here in the multipurpose building uh, this coming week, any of our men that would be able to stay around for just a little while after services, uh, we are going to uh, pick up all of the chairs, stack them, and put them over uh, out of the way. So if you're helping, uh, either stack them or, uh, again, we'll probably have a couple of guys designated uh, to move those stacks of chairs. Sometimes they're a little tricky uh, to move and they can, uh, they can be, they can actually slip out from underneath this. So, uh, but if you're able to help in stacking the chairs, uh, we'll probably stack them as a row uh, to conserve space. Uh, the center rows, we stack them in fives to six. Uh, so any of you guys that would be able to hang around for a while and stack all of our chairs uh, so that we can get them moved out of the way uh, so they can start work Monday morning, we would greatly, greatly appreciate that. And I am so grateful for all of the work that's been done behind the scenes. Uh, there's been a, a lot of uh, calls, phone calls, uh, following up with different things, coordination, uh, that, that's taken place uh, through our trustees and other members of our board and of our church. And we're just so grateful uh, for all of those that are making uh, these upgrades for us. And we greatly, greatly appreciate it. Uh, so that's some information uh, that we wanted to let you know about. And again, if you can help at the end of the service, we would appreciate it. I um, want to make mention of a couple of prayer requests that are on our prayer list. Uh, continue to pray for Sister Georgia Mitchell. She had her PET scan this week. Uh, as far as I know, still waiting for the doctor's return call on what they find from that PET scan. So pray for Sister Georgia. Um, we've also got some infants that are on our prayer list that we want to continue uh, to pray for. Uh, the Elizabeth twins uh, that were born prematurely down in Little Rock, we want to continue to pray for them. Um, also, Ivy Claire Hawkins. Uh, this is in relation to Janice Atkinson. Uh, an infant had open heart surgery. She's recovering from that. And so we want you to pray for them. And then also Lillian Sims. Uh, this is Roy Sims' granddaughter. They brought her home. Uh, is that what I heard? They brought her home 
uh, this week, but certainly could use uh, the prayers of the church and the church family, so let's remember all of them. Um, also, uh, there's another uh, child, uh, Aislinn, uh, request, and I, I never say that right, but it's uh, Barbara Garner's uh, great-granddaughter, Carol Roscoe's granddaughter. Uh, we want to continue to pray uh, for them. And then uh, another member of our church had surgery this week, Brother Ron Gould, uh, had knee replacement surgery. Last I heard he was doing very well, uh, but let's continue to pray for him. And then also, uh, some of you may recall, uh, you may not, but uh, Connie York. Uh, Connie attended our church a number of years ago uh, until, until her health uh, prevented her, and then she went to be with other family. Uh, but Sister Connie passed away this week, and uh, her funeral will be, uh, I think maybe this afternoon. Is, uh, is that right? This afternoon, I think, maybe. Uh, but anyway, uh, pray, pray for the York. Uh, family and continue to be uh, with them as well. God bless you again. Let's stand together. Uh, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. And again, we appreciate so much uh, you being in services. Uh, if you have an unspoken request, would you just would you just acknowledge that? I know there's lots and lots. I've got I've got some unspoken requests on my heart. And so you pray, you pray that God will do what only God can do in such a spectacular and marvelous way. Would you just bow with us in prayer, please? Father, we say thank you again. God, you are so good to us. And Lord, we're glad that we can call upon you in our time of need. All of these requests, these little infants and young children that need a touch from you, uh, God be with them. These families that have lost loved ones, comfort and strength in them. And then God, for the things that we uh, can't control things that are outside of our own abilities and, and we can't fix it and we can't determine what the future holds but God you know uh, you know what holds tomorrow because you hold it tomorrow and you hold it for us and God you guide us and you direct us and God we're going to trust in you with all of our heart we're going to lean upon you uh, even though we may not understand God, we understand that if we'll do that, you will direct our path and you will help us in our time of need. We love you. Thank you for our church family. Thank you for a praying church. And thank you, Lord, for a church that's on the move. Uh, one that is excited about what God is doing and what God wants to do. Not only within our congregation, but within our community, within families, Lord, that we might reach out to and we might help. Uh, to direct them in, in, a, in a way that would lead them into a full assurance of God's love, God's direction, and God's peace. Thank you again for this time together. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all the church said, Amen. Amen. Remain standing and sing with us if you would.
what we've done, God, maybe what we're in the middle of right now or what's to come. That God, your love walks with us through those things. And so we know because of the hope that Jesus has given us on this earth that we can sing about future things that are great and that will be things that will be amazing. But God, we know that while we're on this earth that you have us here for a purpose. And so we ask that you would speak to our hearts today. It's in your name that we pray, that we sing, that we worship. Amen. Amen. You want to go ahead and take your seat. And if you are here as a kid, you want to head upstairs from here. Right. Thank you so much for being at services. Thank you for being part of our church family. And uh, it's always good to see so many kids and volunteers, the nursery staff, the children's church is so active. And uh, we just appreciate uh, all of the volunteers and all the helpers uh, that it takes to make a service uh, go and, and do uh, and, and kind of be seamless and flawless. And we've got some of those uh, that you just don't have to worry about. It. It's, it's done. It's done. And we're so grateful for that. Uh, if you have your Bibles, um, we're going to be looking at a lot of Scripture, but uh, the Scripture that I'll probably draw your attention to the most is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. And that's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. Through 17. We started uh, our series uh, some time ago uh, talking about the foundation of the church. And we talked about those truths that we must stand upon. Uh, and whenever we talk about those truths that we must stand upon, as long as we stand upon the Word of God, the Bible says that His Word never fails. Uh, and that's what it's talking about when it talks about the love that never fails. His word uh, is infallible, it's inerrant. Uh, in the end of time, in the end of day, at the judgment, it's God's word uh, that will stand and will be judged by. And so it's on these truths that we want to stand upon because we know as long as we're standing on those truths, uh, we can't err, we can't falter, and we will not fail. Uh, we look at, or we are looking at that last subject uh, in that series this week. Uh, the first subject that we looked at was Jesus' resurrection. Now, uh, that was on Easter Sunday morning, and, and, and we talked a lot about uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and how that drew uh, so many worshipers and drew uh, those that were seeking Jesus and those types of things. Uh, all the way up until the time that he ascended back up into heaven after he rose from the dead. The second time uh, that we covered this series, we talked about fellowship, uh, how that it's more than just meeting, it's more uh, than just an activity. Uh, it is a state of worship, fellowship uh, with God, fellowship with one another, uh, bearing one another's burden, praying uh, with those that are down and uh, disheartened and, and rejoicing with those uh, that are on that mountaintop. And so that fellowship with one another it is such an important thing. And then uh, the last two weeks, actually Brother Stan uh, Bunch was our guest speaker and he talked about discipleship. The following week uh, I talked about how important it is uh, that we follow the teachings uh, and the commandments that Jesus left with us. Uh, but this week, uh, we're going to be looking at our resurrection. And uh, this, this, I've looked forward ever since I uh, kind of first started thinking about this series. Uh, I've been so excited to kind of get to this point uh, in talking about these truths that we can stand upon and our resurrection being one of those. Now, the scripture or the text that we kind of use throughout this series is actually uh, found in Matthew chapter 28. Uh, and, and in this series, uh, we've used this because it relates so well uh, to everything that we've kind of used as the basis of our subject. Uh, upon Jesus' ascension back up into heaven, after his resurrection, he appeared uh, for a few days for those that had seen him 
uh, but in, he, he was about to ascend back into the heavens, but he gave one last commandment uh, to all of the disciples and all of those that were there. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And then this last part is the part that we're covering today. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Would you just bow and pray with me once more? As we ask God to honor his word, to enlighten our spirits so that we might understand the scripture in the fullness that it has given to us. Father, thank you so much. Again, Lord, we bow before you with reverence, with awe. We bow before you acknowledging you as the one who holds all the power, all the authority. Lord, whenever we are living and going through this life unsure and uh, with the doubts and the questions and, and the, uh, the difficulties that life brings, uh, Lord, I'm just so grateful that we can come to you and know uh, that we can stand upon these fundamental truths that don't waver. They never go away, but they stand the test of time and even through eternity. I'm so grateful, Lord, that we get to cover this subject of the bodily resurrection of your church, those who have claimed Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, those who have been born again and taken on that second life of life eternal. Lord, uh, we are just so excited about these scriptures and these truths today that we're talking about. And God, pray that you'll open our hearts and our minds in Jesus' name that we pray and we'll ask it in his precious name. Amen. Now, the bodily resurrection was new, not a new concept that developed after Jesus ascended back up into heaven. A uh, bodily resurrection was actually goes all the way back into the Old Testament. We're going to share uh, some verses of Scripture out of Daniel uh, and many other Scriptures that we could allude to, but uh, the, even the Old Testament talks about a bodily resurrection. Now, you hear in Jesus' time a lot of conversation uh, about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, now, these were two different groups of people. They were both political people. They were both um, even religious uh, people of the day, but, but they had some different thoughts. They had some different beliefs. They had some different teachings. Now, the Pharisees uh, were more in line with what we believe today, and they actually believed in a bodily resurrection. And so there was a lot of controversy. Even Paul draws it out uh, in some of his teachings because Paul was a Pharisee. Uh, you remember he even refers to him uh, as one who sat at the feet uh, of, of some of the greatest uh, teachers of the day. And those teachers were Pharisees. They were teachers of the law, the Mosaic law and all of those things. And so uh, Paul, he was a, a Pharisee uh, before he was converted into Christianity and had became a follower uh, of Christ. And so uh, we find that the Pharisees believed in a bodily resurrection, uh, but the Sadducees, on the other hand, were actually more elite in their political stance. They were more elite in their uh, financial stance. They were actually respected more than even what the Pharisees were, but the Sadducees did not believe in a bodily resurrection. Now, here's, here's how you can keep those two straight. The Pharisees believed in a bodily resurrection. The Sadducees did not believe in a bodily resurrection. That's why they were so sad, you see. 
sad, you see. No resurrection. Okay. <laughs> bad, bad, right? All right, you, you'll get it, you'll get it. Uh, you'll remember that. You'll remember, oh, brother Dan, you remember that bad joke? That was worse than me. Anyway, you'll remember. Um, so this is not a new train of thought. But it is one that excites, should excite, the Christian. It, it should bring something to the table of the Christian life that makes us just so, I don't know the words, I can't put it exactly how I would like to, but it, but it should bring some life to the church, right? Whenever you're talking about a bodily resurrection, uh, it should bring something into the Christian life that, that makes us excited, that makes us uh, a little bit anticipating or, or looking forward to or putting our hope and our trust in understanding that there will be a day that this body, this temporary fleshly body will be no more and we will be given a new body and we will forever be to the end of the age. That's how Jesus said it. He said, and lo, I will be with you to the end of the age. Not the day, but the end of the age. That's important. And so it should bring something like that to our life. Now let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, because Paul, writing to the church in Thessalonica, brings a great, great scripture and a great teaching to the early church and still to the present day church. In verse 13, it goes like this. We want you to know about those Christians who have died. So you will not be sad as others who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and that he rose again. So because of him, God will raise with him, or raise with Jesus, those who have died. What we tell you now is the Lord's own message. Now I want you to get that, okay? This is not Dennis's message. This is not Paul's message. This is not the apostles' message. This is not free will Baptist doctrine uh, other than it is what we believe as the Lord's own message. And here is the message the Lord wants you to know and wanted all of us to know and wanted his disciples to know. We who are living when the Lord comes again, we will not go before those who have already died. The Lord himself, get it? The Lord himself, he's not sending an angel as he had done in the past. He, he's not sending another messenger. He's not sending a prophet. The Lord himself will come down from heaven the place in which those 500 that stood on the seashore on that day that watched Jesus ascend up into heaven and the angel appeared to them and said, why stand you gazing up into heaven in the same fashion, in the same manner? He will come again. And so Paul is writing to the church of Thessalonica and he says, uh, we who live uh, when the Lord comes again will not go before those who have already done Died. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. So he's not coming alone. He's coming with all of those other messengers, all of those other forms of communication that God had sent all of those years before. And so here he comes, the Lord himself coming down from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God. And then listen closely. And those who have died believing in Christ will rise first. Amen. 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 Those who believe in Christ and are dead, their physical body, this earthly body, though it be dead and buried in the grave, it will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive will be gathered up with them in the 
the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And then listen to this last part. And we will be with the Lord. What's that last word? Forever. Forever we will be with the Lord. Now remember, he told his disciples, and lo, I will be with you till the end of age. Paul is saying to the church of Thessalonica that whenever that day comes, whenever the Lord returns again, and then great trump sounds, and the voice of the archangel, and all of those things, and we understand that the dead will rise first, but then they which are alive will be caught up, and we will be with him forever we will be with the Lord. I cannot emphasize how important the bodily resurrection and that simple truth that we need to stand upon, how influential it is in our belief, in our conversations, in our doctrine, uh, in our daily walk, that should be a constant, present truth that helps us even through some of those darkest and trying times. Right. You remember the story about one of Jesus' friends. He died. Actually, he got word. He was away from uh, this certain area in which he lived. And, and so he had two sisters. Those two sisters sent word to Jesus that Lazarus was sick. Lazarus, a good friend of Jesus. Mary and Martha, his two sisters, he spent tons of time at their house in fellowship and learning and teaching and all of those things. They fed him. He was friends, close friends. And so Mary and Martha had sent word with a messenger to Jesus that Lazarus was sick, and he was sick unto death. And Jesus does something for the first time that is a little bit what we would consider out of character. It says that Jesus lingered or tarried for some time before he decided to go to where Lazarus lived. Some of the disciples even questioned Jesus and said, Jesus, your friend is sick. Why aren't we going? And Jesus made this proclamation to his disciples. He said, it's so that the people, it's so that you and everyone that hears this story will be confident that I truly am the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah of the world. It's for your good that I tarry, even though Lazarus is sick and dying. So he tarries. He finally ends up going. And whenever word gets to the house of Mary and Martha, there's a whole crowd of people that are there that are mourning with Mary and Martha. And so uh, Martha gets word that Jesus is approaching and he's just outside of town. Martha jumps up, she leaves the house, and she runs and she meets Jesus just before he gets into town. No one went with her. It is just Martha and Jesus and the disciples that had come with him. And this conversation begins to start between Martha and Jesus. And so Jesus says this. This is the first, some of the first words that Jesus says to Martha. Martha, your brother shall rise again. Martha, take hope, take courage, take confidence. Your brother will rise again. Amen. And now, this, this tells you this is not a new doctrine, it's not a new teaching, but it's something that has been established by God from the very beginning of time. Martha says unto Jesus, I know he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Lord, I know he's going to rise again. I understand but she still was in mourning. She was still at a loss. She was still grieving her brother's death. And so she still, even in that darkest time, I can't think of anything that is more sobering and more fearful. 
fearful that people take into their life as the fear of death. Some people, I've heard stories of people that whenever you're at work, and, and the conversation of death comes up that they will book it out of there. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to think about it. They don't want it to be a conversation. They just book it out of there and they'll come back later whenever the conversation changes. Fear is most times attributed to death. And so even though Martha's grieving, even though she's going through this emotional pain, she still understands that in the resurrection, at the last day, her brother Lazarus will rise again. And then Jesus says these words. Now listen, this, this is probably the most important thing I will say throughout this entire sermon. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And then Jesus poses this question to Martha. Martha, do you believe this? I'm posing that question to you. Do you believe in the bodily resurrection? Do you believe in it? Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? And that anyone that believes in him, though he be dead, yet shall he live. Do you believe that? Is that a truth that you're willing to stand upon? When are you going to stand on it? Right now. Right now is the time to stand on it. Not whenever you're standing at the graveside. Not whenever you're standing at the casket. Not whenever the, the news of, of the, the, the sickness is there. It's we stand upon that truth right now and we walk in that truth for the rest of our days rest of our life, this is a truth that we can stand upon. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in him, though he did, yet shall he live. And look at Martha's response. Martha said to Jesus, yes, Lord, I believe thou art the Christ, the Son of God. And she left. And she went to find her sister, Mary. And so she runs back to the house. She goes into the house. Mary is still there, weeping and crying with all of the other friends and family that were there mourning at the house. Martha says, hey, Jesus is just outside the city. He has asked for you to come. Martha gets up, gets out of the house, and begins to run to the outside of town to meet Jesus, and all the others in the house, they say, well, Mary must be going to the tomb to mourn her brother's loss. And so they all begin to follow her. Now here's a, here's a really odd question that I'm going to ask. Who lived in that house? Two sisters, Mary and Martha. 
Now, there's two things that I want you to get from this story. Number one, sometimes you need to go to Jesus all by yourself, like Martha. It's just you and him. Just you and him having that intimate conversation. Lord, here's what I'm dealing with. Here's what I'm going through. Here's what I need. Here's what I am offering to you. I offer you my life. I offer you my existence. I offer you my future, my past, my present. Sometimes we need to have that individual, intimate time like Martha did. Now here's the irony. Do you remember the other story of Mary and Martha and Lazarus? Do you remember that it was Mary that sat at the feet of Jesus and it was Martha that was running around the house trying to fix the food and be, and so do you remember Mary said to Jesus, hey Jesus, why don't you make Martha sit down? Jesus said, don't fault her. She's going to have her time. You see, Jesus knew. Jesus knows everything that's going to happen, when it happens, how it's going to happen, and when it's going to happen. And I think Jesus knew Martha's day was coming. It wasn't on that day. It was on this day. Martha had that intimate time with Jesus. And it was Mary who came with the crowd. So there's times that you need to have an intimate time with Jesus, but there's times that you, in your own faith, love, and commitment to the Lord, you're going to lead somebody to life, and they don't even know who they're following and where they're going. You will never know. You will never know the impact that you have whenever you stand upon the truth of the resurrection of the body and the fact that one day the Lord will come again and those who have already died in Christ will go forth and they will meet the Lord in the air with their resurrected body and then we which are alive and remain will be caught up to be with Him forever. Whenever Mary got to Jesus, it's where we find that as she's weeping and as the other mourners are coming that are crying and weeping, we find this scripture where Jesus had compassion upon them and, and upon the fact that they were mourning death and the reality of that set in even with Jesus. And we find that shortest memory verse that every kid in, in the United States has ever memorized because it's easy. Jesus wept. Right? Do you, do you have a memory verse? Yes, I do. What's your memory verse? Jesus wept. Oh, good, good. That's really good. Jesus wept. He wept on that day that Mary came to meet him outside of the city. They aren't even at the tomb yet. They are outside of the city. And so Jesus says to Mary and Martha, where have you laid him? And so they all go, Mary, Martha, Jesus, and all the followers, all the disciples, and they go and they appear before a cave that's had a huge stone rolled in front of it. And Jesus approaches the cave and he says, roll away the stone. It's Martha that says, Lord, <laughs> let's think about this now. He's been dead for three days. Don't be a little rank. It's going to stink. His body has already started to decay. There's no reason we understand that he will be re resurrected on that last day. We, you don't have to prove anything to us. Don't put us through this. We believe you for what you said. I hope that we can believe God for what he says. I hope he doesn't have to prove himself to us over and over and over again. I, in my best way of putting it, quit trusting in the things that you see and put faith in the things that are unseen. Amen. That's the Christian life. Right. It's not in the things that we see. It's the things that we don't see. And we put our full confidence, our full trust in him 
and in him alone. I am not going to get through this entire sermon by any means, any way. Either you're going to get another load of it tonight, or you're going to get another load of it to next Sunday, one or the other. But I'm just here to tell you, there is way too much that God's Word says about the bodily resurrection that we're not going to be able to get to. But I will tell you this. Jesus said to Martha, it's going to be okay. Roll away the stone. They rolled away the stone. And this is what Jesus said to Martha. Whenever she questioned whether they should roll the stone away, he said, I said, let me kind of go back to some parenting 101. Remember, I think I talked about the McGinley house a couple of weeks ago. My dad was a firm believer, and, and my boys also know that I'm a firm believer. That if I tell you once, I shouldn't have to tell you again. If I've asked you to do something once, I shouldn't have to ask you again, because if I have to ask you that second time, that's whenever the elbow grab and the, you remember that? That's, that's whenever those usually started. It was on that second conversation. Now Jesus had already had this conversation with Martha. Martha had already said, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. I believe that. And so now they're at the tomb. The stone is rolled away. And she said, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. And Jesus says, Martha, I already told you. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, yet they were dead, yet shall they live. Do you believe it? Do you believe it enough to put your faith in it? Because there's a difference in just believing it or knowing it than putting your faith into it. And so Jesus said, I've already said to you, what is thou believe, thou shalt see the glory of God. And at that point, Jesus prays in front of all of those who are there, and he simply says, Lord, for the sake of all of those that witness this, reveal your glory in me. And whenever he did that, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible says, Lazarus, the dead man, that had been in the tomb for three days, that had been pronounced by the doctors of the time, and that all of the family had witnessed his last breath. Lazarus, wrapped in his blood grave clothes, comes waddling out of the cave, and then Jesus says this. He says, loose him and let him free. You see, that's what this particular truth that we stand upon will do for you. It will set you free. It will set you free from the fear of death. It will set you free from the anxiety and all the things that happen. It doesn't eliminate it. You'll still mourn. You'll still be afraid. But you'll have a confidence and a hope in your God that will help you get through those hard days. Those days where you feel out of control and, and helpless and all those things. I believe in all of my heart. This doesn't eliminate all of the natural. Because here's the reality. We've not been given our spiritual body yet. That's part of this entire teaching. Where it talks about, oh grave, where is thy sting? Oh sin, where is thy death? It's all swallowed up in the victory of Jesus. We haven't been given our spiritual body yet. We're still here in the flesh. And so we still 
mourn. We still grieve. We still have fear. We still have all of the same things that everybody else that's ever walked the face of the earth that's had to deal with death has had to deal with before. The difference is we have a truth to stand upon and a hope that will get us through. And so Jesus taught about a resurrected body and a truth that we need to stand upon. Would you stand with me? Because here's one simple thing that I want to let you know. Our resurrection depends upon Jesus' resurrection. And that simple question, do you believe? Have you put your faith, have you put your trust in Jesus? I'm going to read some quick verses to you. And I want you just to take these in for what they say. Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. 1 Corinthians 6, 14. Now God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise up us through his power. 2 Corinthians 4.14 Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. Romans 6 and 5 For I, or for if, we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. All of those scriptures tell us one thing. Our resurrection depends upon Christ's resurrection and our belief, our faith, our trust in him as the Christ, the son of the living God. Are you here today and you're not a Christian? You've never put your faith and trust in Jesus. There's a lot of things I can say, but I'll say this. Eternity has two. Has two existence. It's heaven and hell. There's, there's no in between. Whenever death comes,
right now, and I recognize you as a gracious, powerful, loving God. You've given us hope. You've given us truth. Today, I want to stand upon the truth that there'll be a time that you'll come again and you'll split those clouds of glory. That trump will sound. The voice of the archangel will ring forth. And there'll be an awakening that is unlike any other that's ever taken place on this earth. And there'll be a realization for the follower of Christ, we've got something to look forward to. A place where there is no more pain, where there is no more tears, where there is no more grief, but a place of perfect peace and joy and rest. Father, I pray if someone needs to come today and find the comfort and the peace that you offer, God, let them come. Just between you and them, in Jesus' name we pray. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you need to come today, for any need that you have, but most importantly for your salvation, would you just step out and come? Let us pray. Would you do that?